the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Welcome. How many of us love snakes? How many of us have a pet snake at home? Probably not too many. Why is that? Well, they're cool, they're clammy, they're creepy, they're slithery, kind of the opposite of an affectionate furry puppy or kitty. Even the word serpent comes from the Latin meaning to creep. However, many, if not, if not most snakes, eat, neither are poisonous nor bite people. However, we are most familiar with the ones that do. We tend to think of every snake as a cobra, a python, a rattler, or a coral. Or we think of the anaconda who wraps itself around its victim and suffocates it before eating it. Generally, snakes don't have the best reputation. And snakes, of course, got a bad rap early on, starting from the beginning of creation recorded in the book of Genesis. We know that the devil, in the form of a serpent, deceived the woman Eve in the Garden of Eden. Much later, the serpent was specifically identified as the devil, Satan, in the book of Revelation. And as well, after the exodus from slavery in Egypt, the Israelites were wandering in the desert, and instead of being grateful for their newfound freedom, they were grumbling and murmuring against Moses and God because they were starving and thirsting, despite having manna from heaven. In order to help them repent from their lack of trust and their lack of gratitude, the Lord sent fiery serpents that bit them, and even many died. And that brings us to today's gospel, which Deacon Ted just read, the Sunday before the elevation of the precious cross. And we hear, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The line referring to Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness is significant. And this refers back to the Israelites' affliction of serpents, as I just mentioned. After the people were bitten, they came to Moses, they confessed their sin and pleaded with the, him to save them. And listen to the passage. It says, The people therefore came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord, and he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it, meaning the serpent on the pole, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he or she looked at the bronze serpent, they lived. Jesus, speaking of himself, draws a direct connection between the serpent on the pole and the Son of Man on the cross. Because Jesus spoke these words early in his ministry, the disciples probably did not make the connection with the cross until after the crucifixion and resurrection. Just like the bronze serpent on the pole had real power 
to heal those bitten by snakes, the cross has real power to heal Christians who are ill because of sin through the deception of the devil. The image of the cross has this power because Christ was crucified on a cross. Just like Jesus changed the nature of baptism through his own baptism in the Jordan River, transforming it from mere cleansing from sin to union with himself, likewise, he takes a tool of death, crucifixion, the means of capital punishment for non-Romans at the time, and makes it the sign and the image of the victory over sin and death. In other words, the cross is now a means of healing and eternal life. And of course, the cross is now the symbol for being a follower of Christ. Orthodox Christians not only wear a cross around their neck, but they, of course, also make the sign of the cross to bless themselves. And it is a confession of faith in the Holy Trinity, in the dual nature of Christ, in his incarnation. And it is a confession that we love the Lord our God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. If anyone doubts or questions the purpose and efficacy of making, of wearing, of displaying the sign of the cross, listen to what our patron apostle Paul says in today's epistle reading. He says that the cross, that Jesus canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which were hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Later in the same book, letter to the Galatians, he said, May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And of course, in 1 Corinthians, he says, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I don't know if that's God calling or somebody else. <laughs> but to us, the cross, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The church fathers in the subsequent first few centuries, they taught the same thing. Tertullian in the second century says, in all travels and movements, in all our coming in and going out, in putting on our shoes, at the bath, at the table, in lighting our candles, in lying down, in sitting down, whatever employment or work occupies us, we mark our forehead with the sign of the cross. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the fourth century said this, let us not be ashamed to confess the crucified, meaning Jesus. Let the cross as our seal be boldly made with our fingers on our brow on all occasions, over the bread we eat, over the cup we drink, in our comings in, our goings out, before sleep, lying down, rising up, when we are on the way, when we are still. It is a powerful safeguard it is without price, for the sake of the poor, without toil, because of the sick, for it is a grace from God, a badge of the faithful, and ter a terror to devils. For he, Christ, displayed them openly, leading them away in triumph by the force of it. For when we see the cross, we are reminded of the crucified one. They fear him, who has smashed the heads of dragons. Despise not the seal as a free gift, but rather for this reason, honor your Lord all the more. Even the Protestant reformer Martin Luther in the 16th century taught the same thing. He said, in the morning when you rise, 
make the sign of the cross and say in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us remember that Jesus, the Son of Man, was lifted up so that those who believe in him may have life. Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. And believing in Jesus Christ means that we must avoid grumbling and murmuring against God and his appointed leaders when things are not going our way. Rather, belief in Jesus Christ means that when we suffer from the hunger of spiritual emptiness and when we thirst for true righteousness, we turn to God's prophets and priests and ask them to help us, ask them to pray for us so that God may give us a sign, give us direction, give us a way back to him. God the Father wants to save us, so let us not condemn ourselves by allowing the devil to bite us and deceive us. Amen.